Great. Okay, yes, yeah, so I'm John Linford. I work for ARM. I could do a sort of a lighthearted talk here called How to Optimize for ARM and Not Get Eaten by a Bear. Um, the, the idea is really we're going to talk about how do you do performance optimization in this world of, of multiple microarchitectures. And my talk is a sort of counterpoint to Tony's where he was focusing on how do you get your code to properly compiled for A64FX. I'm going to talk about how you can take some of the codes you've been working on at A64FX and make them a little more portable without hopefully sacrificing too much performance. Uh, the motivation for this talk really came around uh, around the announcement of Graviton 3 because I started getting you know just more emails and phone calls than ever um, from software vendors asking, all right, so how so I've been working on A64FX, how am I going to take my code and make it work on Graviton 3? I see this ship has SVE, um, but it looks like it's a different SVE. Um, you know, what, what's the microarchitecture? What, what, how do I do this? And by the time I'd answered the seventh or eighth email, I figured I probably should just put some slides together and, and put this, you know, put this down. So ARM, the, the challenge with ARM, you know, and when someone comes to me and says, I want to optimize for ARM, the, the real challenge is that ARM enables diversity in CPU design. And so if you look back over the last few years in this sort of pseudo timeline, you can see that we've got a lot of different companies building a lot of different chips, using a lot of different microarchitectures and different ISAs. And all of these are at some level an ARM chip because they all use ARM IP in some way. But each of them is in fact its own product. It's, it has its own unique problem that it's meant to solve. And if you take a, a code and you optimize it you know, very specifically for that chip, you soon get a binary that won't run on other chips or will run very poorly on other chips. So how do you find that sweet spot where you can target you know, two, three, four uh, leading ARM architectures without becoming wholly bound and tied to a specific design? And as I was thinking about this, I was reminded of this, there's this children's book, which if you're a parent, you, you may already be familiar with this, but there's this really charming book called We're Going on a Bear Hunt. And it's this fun little poem you do with your kids where um, you're pretending to go on a bear hunt and you're going down this path to the bear's cave. And as you go down the path, you, uh, you encounter different obstacles like squelchy mud and a big dark forest. And, and so you have to get past these obstacles on the way down to the bear's cave. And at the end of it, you go into the bear's cave and you find the bear and, and everybody gets really frightened and they all run away and it's, it's a lot of fun. And to me, I think optimizing a code for ARM is a little bit like this because in a sense, you're taking your application and you're walking it down this optimization path and you're encountering these different features along the path, which are more and more specific to that path as you go along until ultimately you come to the bear's cave, which is the vendor specific part of this. And once you go into that cave, you're become fully vendor specific. And if you, if you go too far into the cave, you, you run the risk of being eaten by the bear. You become bear. And at that point, you are 100% uh, dedicated to this particular chip. And so the, the trick is, how do we go down there, even go into the cave if necessary, without getting eaten by the bear? Um, I think the way to do this is to understand how ARM architectures work. So there's a difference between the architecture and the microarchitecture. The ARM architecture, the core instruction set architecture, or ISA, is hierarchical. So you can have an 8.4, 8.3, 8.2, 8.1, and so on. And a chip that implements, for example, an ARM V8.2-A uh, fully supports an 8.1 and an 8.0. In addition to having these core architectures, there are extensions. You've already seen one of them in Tony's talk, the Scalable Vector Extension, SVE. These are little plus pluses you can put onto that core ISA implementation. So if I put up three different cores here, each of these has its own architecture and its own microarchitecture, but the architecture has common features across all three cores. So the Neo versus V1, the A64FX, and the N1, they all implement the ARM V8.2-A ISA. Now, in addition to that, the V1 and the A64FX both implement the SVE extension. Uh, and all of these implement some extensions that go into later ISAs as well. So I would say, for instance, that the N1 is an 8.2 chip because that is the highest level of complete ARM ISA standard that it implements. But in fact, there are 8.3, 8.4, and 8.5 extensions implemented in the N1 as well. This means that I can take a binary, build it for N1, 
And there will be parts of those, there will be instructions in that binary, which are understood by something like a, in, like a V1, which implements the 8.4 standard. So the ISA is just the vocabulary of instructions that the CPU can, it can, can work with, right? It's, it's the language the CPU speaks. But how those are implemented is the microarchitecture. And this is where things get really interesting. And this is where the performance starts to become part of a picture because the microarchitecture influences instruction latency. It influences how many functional units are available to retire a given instruction. It's really how that language of the CPU becomes performance. And so to talk about this a little bit, I'm gonna use this uh, sort of cartoony chart where on the horizontal axis, I'm showing base architectures. Um, this is a, a course resolution, so I'm not showing extensions, but essentially the idea is that we can have um, a progression of 8.0 to 8.4 in, in these architectures. On the vertical axis, I'm showing micro architectures. This is how that ISA is implemented. So although I'm showing some chip names, things like the Fujitsu A64FX, I'm not talking about the A64FX as a chip. I'm speaking specifically about the microarchitecture that the A64FX uses. So if we were to look for the A64FX on this chart, it actually, it actually occupies this whole area because the A64FX implements the 8.2 ISA using the Fujitsu A64FX microarchitecture. And that means that any executable that falls into this space spanning the 8.0 to the 8.2 and the Fujitsu A64FX microarchitecture is guaranteed to run on this chip, the A64FX. Now, this chart also lets us play around with some fun ideas. Like um, we can pretend that there were things like an ARM V8.4 that was somehow implemented with the Thunder X microarchitecture. This chip never existed, it never will exist. But um, this hopefully illustrates a little bit that separation between architecture and microarchitecture, which is very explicit in the ARM universe. In practice, these things are slightly coupled, and that's why I have the slight, the, I have the horizontal blue lines here to, to help sort of chop up how microarchitecture and architecture track in real life. Um, but here we're going to stick to the, the more abstract. Now, how do we specify architecture and microarchitecture in our applications? If, if I've told you that the thing to do is look for, um, you know, look for the ISA, not the chip, how do you do that? Well, both the GCC compilers and the LLVM, LLVM compilers and pretty much all LLVM-based compilers support these three flags. And for ARM, they have a different meaning than for x86. That's pretty key because if your build system is being updated to support ARM, you'll need to check how these flags are being used. The mArch flag specifies the architecture. It specifies the ISA, the vocabulary that the CPU speaks. And it doesn't say anything about the way those instructions are implemented necessarily. It only says that these are the instructions the compiler is allowed to choose from when it's generating code. And you can do some fine grained control over that ISA. Like I can say 8.2-A plus SVE. SVE is an extension to the 8.2. So if I, if I didn't have that plus SVE, the compiler wouldn't think that it's allowed to generate SVE instructions. The mTune flag uh, is, is a bit of a misnomer in the ARM universe because it specifies the target microarchitecture. Now it's true microarchitecture and performance are, are fundamentally linked, but as you'll see in a minute, simply saying mTune doesn't mean you get a fast binary. mTune just specifies to the compiler that it's going to be targeting a given microarchitecture. And then mCPU is a shortcut that does both. So mCPU is exactly the same as doing mArch and mTune um, separately. It's just a shortcut for, for um, targeting a specific CPU. So I'll work for, through a few examples here with my, my silly little chart, and we'll, we'll see how this goes. So for instance, if I build a binary and I use the mArch is ARM v8.1 flag, I get an executable that has this blue execution space. That means that any chip which implements this ISA with this microarchitecture is guaranteed to be able to execute that binary. So if there was something like an 8.4 ISA implemented with a Thunder X2 microarchitecture, this binary would definitely run there. Now, that's a theoretical chip. It doesn't exist, but this illustrates the point. The compiler will also attempt a little bit of optimization given the architecture, but since we haven't specified the microarchitecture, 
the compiler's hands are very much tied. It can't tell you what are the latencies of a given instruction or how many functional units are available. It'll do a good job, as good as a job as it can, but it's going to not be able to optimize very much. So we get a fairly limited optimization space. Um, right, sorry, I should have been tapping through here. There's also a region of this chart where the binary is guaranteed to, uh, well, excuse me, where the binary is not guaranteed to execute. Now, by chance, the compiler may only generate 8.0 instructions because the 8.1 is a superset of 8.0. So it may happen that your binary could execute on an 8.0 chip, but this is not a good idea, right? You, it really would be just good luck if that happened. You should assume that if you specify 8.1, then 8.0 chips will not be able to run this binary. So let's look at Mtune. This is where we specify the microarchitecture. I've specified the microarchitecture, but I have not specified the architecture, the ISA. And what you get is a little bit surprising because most people, and certainly when I see Mtune equals A64FX, I think that means make the binary fast for A64FX. But what you actually get is an architecture, the ISA, is assumed to be ARM v8.0. It's a fundamental, basic, minimal ARM ISA. And then it's tuned for the A64FX microarchitecture. So the thing we get, this binary, has a very limited vocabulary. Specifically, it can't generate SVE instructions. There will be no SVE in this binary. Even though I've said M2 and A64FX, you won't take advantage of those wide vector units in the A64FX. The instructions that are generated will be tuned for the A64FX microarchitecture, but there's a limited number of instructions, so the result is fairly unoptimized. However, it's highly portable. It's tuned for A64FX, and it'll run on just about any ARM architecture, but performance is going to be limited because of the limited ISA. Okay, so if you specify both, the, both the ISA and the microarchitecture, you get a highly optimized binary for that target. The compiler has the full vocabulary of the system. It has the full understanding of the microarchitecture. You'll get the best possible performance out of the compiler. So with one flag, mCPU equals A64FX, or with two flags, and I'll show a few of those in a minute, you can get the best performance. Portability is severely limited in this case. Uh, not only have we specified that you know this binary will only run on chips that are are equal to or greater than um, the A64FX. Uh, we've also possibly taken advantage of some understanding of the A64FX microarchitecture. So if there's anything, uh, any workarounds or um, specific quirks that the compiler w is is aware of, then that gets factored into the binary. So you've got a very limited portability with this, and in fact. The view of where this thing can run and how, how well it's optimized looks a little more like this because um, that ability of the compiler to take advantage of extensions and, and any tweaks or changes means that we've basically told the compiler this binary will only ever run on the A64FX and so the compiler will do that as, uh, to the best of its ability. This is what I mean by getting eaten by the bear. So at this point, I've generated a binary which you should not think of as portable. It only runs on A64FX. Sometimes that's necessary, but it, it can be a challenge if you're somebody like a, like a software vendor. It's very easy to demonstrate these flags. If you write something like five or six lines of C code and, and call the sync fetch and add uh, extension from GCC, this is a, an ex extension that would do essentially an atomic add on, on a memory address. If I pass only the mArch flag, with A64FX architecture, RMB8.2, well, I haven't enabled the SVE extension. Now, the 8.2 does support atomics, so the compiler will generate the atomics, but SVE is not used in this binary. Um, worse, if I say mTune equals A64FX, I've got a minimal ISA, no SVE, and I don't have atomics either, because atomics didn't come in until the 8.2 standard. So now I have, I, instead of getting a nice atomic instruction, I'm actually invoking a, a libgcc call to do this, this function. So M2 and A64FX is the worst of both worlds. Bad ISA, or broad, broad ISA, uh, excuse me, port, portable ISA with, um, 
with, with, with uh, little understanding of, of the A64FX capability. But if you set specify photos, the ISA and the, the uh, microarchitecture with MCPU, then you get what you expected. So a couple of examples, right? Let's, let's come back to the moment where people are asking me, how do I take my A64FX code and plan ahead for future ARM architectures that have SVE? So here's a couple of examples of flags where you could build an application that would have decent performance on the A64FX and really good performance on something like a Neoverse V1. So first, if I want to generate a V1 optimized binary that runs on A64FX, I look for the common denominator between those two chips, ISA, which happens to be the 8.2 with SVE. Now there's a catch here because SVE can be implemented at different vector bit widths. So if I want to make this put truly portable between those architectures, I need to restrict myself to using SVE vector bits equals scalable so that the um, compiler doesn't make any assumptions about the width of the, of the SIMD registers. But I can specify the architecture and then I can specify the, I can tell the compiler to go ahead and tune for the V1 while using scalable SVE. These flags should generate a binary which runs pretty well on the V1 and pretty well on the A64FX. Neither will be as optimal as if we built solely for that chip, but you have something now which is portable and is going to do a fairly good job. Another, probably the thing that's going to hurt the A64FX most is that the V1 has similar performance with Neon as it does with SVE. The V1 implements SIMD at um, 256, well, it's either dual 256-bit SVE or quad 128-bit Neon. Now, if you think of this as just 512 bits of vector bandwidth, um, which is kind of how the chip approaches it, you can see that for applications where, um, where, where having SVE's additional features you know, is, is not critical, Neon and SVE should perform about the same. And in fact, that's how it works. So the compiler, when tuning for the Neoverse V1 microarchitecture, will often generate Neon over SVE, just because it's a better, you know, it, it's going to work better in that instruction mix. On the A64FX, Neon is about 25% the performance of SVE. And so that piece of code, which has been tuned for the V1, is just going to crawl on the A64FX. Still runs, but it'll be slower. And that's the trade-off. Um, another example of V1 optimized but running on the N1. So this is a sort of backwards compatibility going back to the N1. The key thing here is that I can turn off SVE, but I can actually turn on the dot product instructions because you can see the ARM V3, uh, sorry, the V8.3 is fully implemented in the V1. And the N1 implements the uh, dot product extension from the 8.4. Excuse me, I said 8.3, I might have meant 8.4. Um, so you can support dot product instructions on both of them. You can enable them explicitly on the command line. And then a very simple case, right? The N1 is a subset of the V1 in, in terms of ISA. So just optimize for the N1 and you get something that runs on the V1. It's pretty straightforward. Now there's a lot of combinations of this and, and really it comes down to where does your code need to run? If you think you're going to run on the Graviton 3, if you think you're going to run on NVIDIA Grace, you're going to run the A64FX, you can go to this link and take a look at what are the A64, or excuse me, the, the ARM64 options for the GCC compiler, for instance. And you can select the, the set of architecture and architectural extensions that's common across the targets that you need. And then you can pick a microarchitecture where you think, you know, maybe most of the time people will be running on Graviton 3. Then you could target that one explicitly as your tuning flag. Apologies for the dog in the back. The mailman is, you know, out to get us all. Um, so finally, how to so wrap this up, how to get good performance without getting tied to a particular chip, how to hunt the bear and not get eaten by the bear. Well, uh, the easy answer is let someone else hunt the bear. Right? There's a lot, actually a lot of uh, really good already tuned applications out there. For example, on the NVIDIA NGC or ARM's own HPC Wiki will have build instructions for different targets. Um, well, if you, if you have to hunt the bear, okay, so go hunt the bear where it's safe, by which I mean link against portable optimized libraries. Tony mentioned the ARMPL a moment ago. There's been a couple other math libraries mentioned um, on the chat. 
a lot of these have um, the ability to dynamically pick the right ISA uh, even at runtime. So RMPL will, will notice which, which microarchitecture you're on or which platform you're running on and uh, use an optimized version of the, whatever routine you're, you're calling. So it's more portable and, and you still get pretty good performance. Um, if you're writing your own code and you can't link against a library, don't hand tune SIMD code. Looking at you, Gromax guys. Um, I understand that sometimes it has to be done and, and sometimes it, it, it is the right answer. Um, again, looking at you guys, Gromax guys. But um, you know, generally, if you're hand tuning your SIMD code, you, you are feeding yourself to the bear. You gotta be careful with that. Um, if you hunt the bear, stay outside the cave, by which I mean don't do vendor specific stuff out of the gate. Uh, compile for a common base architecture, and when you enable extensions, understand the trade-off you're making. There may be a whole line of vendor chips that now you just can't address because they don't implement that particular extension. Um, and then ultimately, if you do enter the cave, you know, like the ch children's book, they, they, they go in and then they, they all run out. Be sure that you can run out of the cave as well, by which I mean make sure there's always a generic version of your code and that if you're building from source, take advantage of tools like SPAC and EasyBuild that understand architectural level tuning. So, so SPAC, for instance, can, can build for A64FX or Graviton2. Um, it, you know, it does a pretty good job of picking the right flags based on which, which CPU you're on. So it becomes fairly invisible to the user and, and you'll usually get the right answer. All right, that's about it for me. I might have gone a little bit quick, but we have some time for questions. Great, thanks, John. You're, um, yeah, are there some questions? Anybody want to unmute and ask something? I put one in the chat. Did it fall off the, there's a lot of discussion. So what would, what, maybe you could repeat the question. Yes, please. So for John, do you recall the specific ARM chip on the NVIDIA Jetson Nano dev kit? Uh, the specs only say A57. So uh, I only know that's uh, V8, but not sure V8 dot something or That's right. Uh, what? Uh, so it's a 8.2, I believe. The Jetson Nano would be probably the Carmel microarchitecture. Fairly sure. Uh, could be, oh. Uh, See, now I'm wondering if that's that's Xavier or not, but I I, I know it's it's 8.2 at least. 8.2 without SVE. John, could you comment also on the uh, performance you see with um, vector length agnostic code, trying to put that between different platforms? Yeah, this is an interesting one because in many cases, VLA doesn't actually matter um, mm. if, uh, there are definitely places where knowing the vector length makes a big difference. And on A64FX, the, the uh, Fujitsu compiler, for instance, will assume 512 bits because Fujitsu compiler only runs on A64FX. And so you get that additional performance. Why not? Um, usually, VLA is not significantly less performant than VLS, um, but it, it can be. Architectures like the um, like the V1, where the SIMD units can be used either as um, SVE or Neon, they were designed from the beginning so that if you come to a piece of code where vector length specific um, would would help, then Neon can be used because Neon is always 128 bits. It's it's essentially SVE 128 in a, in a kind of sense. Um, so you can do things like complete loop unrolling based on that vector length and, um, and use Neon instead of SVE. So it uh, gives you a wider range of ways to take advantage of that piece of silicon in the chip. Um, it's not free. You know, their, their vector length uh, agnostic coding is, is not free, um, but it can be remarkably cheap. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. I think we have to move on to the next talk. Great, so, thanks. Thanks, John. There's another one, I think, for uh, John. Well, can you just tell us what the question is? 
Uh, Mitchell Dorrell asks, when building code for x86 platforms, GCC allows you to enable arbitrary instructions with option like MAVX2. Are the same options available on ARM? Yes. So the x86 arch so the x86 um, story between around ISA and microarchitecture is a, is a little bit different um, because uh, companies like Intel uh, you have very tight control over both the microarchitecture and the ISA. Um, the specifying one is almost the same thing as specifying the other. They are very tightly linked in that world. So when they need fine grain control, it comes down to more of, uh, you know, which, which specific instructions do you want to control this kind of stuff. Um, you, you essentially, you, you modify your ISA and your microarchitecture simultaneously. This is why the MCPU, the MArch, the MTune flags have different meanings in the x86 world. Um, for example, MArch uh, can, can take a chip name on x86, but MArch has to take an ISA name on ARM. I can't do MArch equals uh, Thunder X2 on ARM. It, it, won't, com it won't compile. That op option is not accepted. Um, but I can do MArch equals Skylake for x86. So the equivalent operation on ARM is to use the extensions. You do plus SVE or plus no SVE, for instance, to turn on or off SVE instructions. 